and it gives me a huge amount of pleasure to 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 welcome somebody who is quite sincerely one of my uh, educational heroes and he's been so enormously generous from the start of research ed and from long before that um, the emeritus professor at the UCL Institute of Education, uh, somebody who's incredibly familiar to most people in education, uh, and somebody who's probably one of the most misspelled names in education, and that is Dylan William. Handing over to you now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Helene. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about today is really a set of ideas that I've been developing over the past 10 years which is really that there's lots of things we could do in education that will help our, our students, our children, our pupils learn more, but not all of them are equally effective. And so the big idea here is I want to talk about how we create the schools our children need. I'm going to look briefly at why we need to raise achievement. I'm going to then look a little bit about what we're doing right now and why it probably won't have much of an impact. And then I'm going to look at what we can do instead. So why do we need to raise achievement? Well, this graph here shows the performance of uh, children, pupils in the UK on PISA uh, ever since it was started in 2000. And what you can see is that basically what's happened is that from a promising start, things have got, if not worse, I think the best description is, is, is at best static. And this is all the more depressing since research on something called the Flynn effect seems to suggest that students' IQs are going up and therefore you know, all the reforms that we've been doing for the national curriculum and all the um, innovations after that don't seem to have helped young people make more progress in school. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters because right now around 17% of students leave school without basic levels of achievement in reading. And the OECD sets thresholds for reading, for maths and science. And they, this is a level of achievement that you need to participate effectively in modern society. And right now, what we're seeing is about 15 to 20% of students don't leave school able to participate effectively in society. And that's going to be even more important in the future because according to the work of people like Alan Blinder and Fred Osborne at Oxford, something like 30% of jobs could be offshored and about half of the work being done in our school, in our workplaces now, could be done by machines with existing technology. So what's going to happen is that the world of work is going to get more complex. The price of admission into fulfilling work is going to go up. Now, I'm not saying that you need a good level of education to get a job. In fact, the latest projections suggest that there'll be more jobs for people with pretty basic levels of achievement than there will be for graduates. But the problem is those jobs won't be great jobs. So I'm going to run quickly through some of the things that people have proposed as being solutions to this. So one example, Michael Gove famously um, banned people like me with third class degrees from getting into teaching, uh, or at least getting a grant. Now, the trouble is that that looks like a sensible thing. We want to raise standards in education. But the fact is that people with better degrees don't seem to be any more effective than people with less, effect, less uh, highly regarded degrees. So there's just no evidence that getting smarter people into teaching will have any impact. One very popular idea is just getting rid of the bad teachers. And, you know, if they're people who are really, really toxic and undermining the efforts of the school, then I have no problem with saying, let's get rid of them. But the difficulty is that our ability to evaluate what a teacher contributes to a child's progress is right now so limited that if we fire the people who we think are ineffective, then we could actually be firing people who are above average. And my favorite story here, it comes from a book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, a statistician. And she talks about New York City's value added scheme, where every teacher in the city was given a value added rating for the quality of the progress their children had made. And Tim Clifford, a high school English teacher, the very first year this was introduced, on a scale of zero to 100, got given a score of six. If he hadn't been tenured, he'd have been fired on the spot, but he had tenure, so he kept his job. And of course, he didn't know what to do differently because there was no feedback for him in six out of 100. So the next year, he taught exactly the same way, and he got a score of 96. So the fact is, our measures of teacher quality are pretty volatile you are far more likely to get a top rating from an observation if you're observed teaching 
high achieving students. And perhaps even more important, good teachers lay foundations for the teachers who teach their students in the future. So often a teacher looks ineffective in the short term, but their children do better in the longer term because such strong foundations have been made. So our ability to fire bad teachers is limited. Uh, another option that's been touted is paying good teachers more. Again, very limited. We, we don't really know um, any sensible way to do this because we can't evaluate teachers with, with any accuracy. The schemes that have been successful, most of them are not, but some of them have been successful and they've been extremely expensive and difficult to maintain. Reducing class size is another popular measure we might take. And I want to make it clear. I think the research is pretty clear. If you reduce class size, the same teacher will get better results, especially if they take advantage of those smaller classes. So people who say reducing class size doesn't work are just talking nonsense in my view. Reducing class size does help. The trouble is, if you reduce class size, you need more teachers. And the crucial question is, how good are those additional teachers? And I've modeled this, and it turns out that if the additional teachers you're hiring because you reduced class size are only as good as the least effective 10% of your existing teachers, then class size reduction will actually make things worse rather than better. Because you have got smaller classes, but you've also got worse teachers. And so reducing class size can be done if you have a good supply of effective teachers waiting in the wings, but it's very expensive and there are better things to do with the money. Uh, one of the things that's very popular on both sides of the Atlantic is expanding school choice. In the charter schools and, and vouchers in America, we have academies and free schools in Britain, and we, before that we had specialist schools. And the evidence is this has almost no impact on student achievement. It looks like you're doing something, it just doesn't have much impact. And then, of course, we've got copying other countries. Back in the 1980s, many of you will remember that we've been told to copy Germany because it didn't have a long tail of underachievement in mathematics. We then discovered in PISA that the reason for this was because most of those low achievers were being kept back a year or two, and so they weren't in the year nine class because they were still in the year eight or the year seven class. And when that was corrected in, in PISA, the Germans found they had an education system that was A, quite mediocre, and B, one where social class predicted achievement more strongly than in any other country. So then attention sw switched to Finland, and people said Finland's wonderful, and it did very well, of course. What people forgot to look at was firstly, the gender gap, because it has one of the largest gender gaps in reading in the develop developed world. And in one year, the, the scores for girls were five, was 560, and the scores for boys was 500. But the other thing that people mistook was that the cause of these effects. In the 2006 PISA, what we were looking at was the result of educational reforms that have been enacted in the 1990s based on changes that have been planned from the 1980s. So all those politicians who went to Finland in 2007 2008, when the results came out, were looking at things that, as it turns out, were making things worse. Because in every single PISA since 2006, the results for Finnish school children have gone down. So all the lessons that people learned from Finland were lessons about how to reduce the performance of an education system. Finally, of course, now the tension has shifted to the Pacific Rim, and it's particularly in Shanghai. The difficulty is that the Shanghai sample is not representative of even the students living in Shanghai and certainly not representative of the whole country. And one killer fact that I like to quote is that according to John Jerim, uh, Australian children of Chinese heritage outperformed Shanghai in the 2015. So the trouble with copying other countries is, first of all, you don't know that they're that successful. Second, you can't be sure of the reasons for their success. And third, even if you could be sure of those reasons, you might not be able to do it in your own country. So I think we should actually look for ideas from other countries, but we should be very skeptical that we can transplant those kinds of ideas wholesale into another system. So what can we do instead? Well, what I'm suggesting is that we need to be asking four questions about research. The first is, does this solve a problem we have? So if you have low teacher subject knowledge, then increasing teacher subject knowledge might help. But if you have high teacher subject knowledge, then it won't help. So first be clear about this is solving a problem you have. The second thing, and the thing that people often ignore, 
is how much will this improve learning? And uh, although people talk about effect sizes, I think those are very poorly understood. And I actually want to know how many extra months of learning will we get if we do this? Now that's um, a problematic metric. It's, it's very hard to work out sometimes, but I would say it's the only thing that we should be looking at because any improvement in education manifests itself in students learning the same amount of stuff in less time. So any worthwhile education reform actually has its effect by increasing the rate at which students learn stuff. And that's why how many extra months of learning per year will we get is the right way to think about this. Then of course we have to think about how much will it cost both in terms of money and in time. And then of course, will it work here? So for example, class size reduction does work if you have a steady supply of good teachers, but it doesn't work if teacher recruitment is challenging. So often something that looks very promising turns out to be impossible to implement in a particular context. And this is why I think school leaders need to be critical consumers of research, because they know their local context better than the researchers who research in another context. And while something might be the right context, the right thing to do in one context, it might be the wrong thing to do in a different context. So what I'm suggesting is there are two things that the research suggests have a really big impact on student achievement in a way that can be implemented. The first is a knowledge-rich curriculum. So why do I think that a knowledge-rich curriculum is so important? Well, let's just take a minute to think about um, this. So if you have a piece of paper handy, I'd like you to just copy that, 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 those five characters onto a piece of paper. Just, just write it out. Now, typically, it takes people about eight to 10 glances at the characters to copy it correctly. If you've studied some Russian, then you'll re recognize some of these letters and therefore it'll take you less time. And if you're a Kazakh speaker, you'll recognize it immediately as the Kazakh word for box. So a Kazakh person could just look at that and write it down straight away. And you might think it's because they have superior visual memory. They have better um, visual attention. And it's not that, it's simply that they recognize it. It's the contents of their long-term memory that is making their use of short-term memory more important. Let me give you another example. Many of you will be familiar with a countdown game where you have to uh, use the, the given numbers using the four rules of arithmetic to come up with a target number. And so many of you will have seen immediately that you can get close to 127 by recognizing that 25 times four is 100. Now here's the important point. A computer would solve this by trying all possible combinations of those numbers. And that's not what most humans do. Most humans recognize that 25 times four is 100. And that fact that 25 times four is 100 jumps unbidden into your consciousness. You're immediately aware of the fact that 25 times four is 100 because you know that that fact. And this is why it's so dangerous to say that children don't need to know their times tables. Yes, of course, it's good if a child doesn't know what six sixes are, but if they can remember that three sixes is 18, and therefore they can remember that if they double that, they'll get 36, and that's okay. But it's not okay because they've used valuable short-term working memory to process that when the person who knows that six sixes is 36 has already had that jumping into their head, jumping into their consciousness, and they're, and they're away in solving the problem. So it, the, the, the big point here is that long-term memory is always influencing what we can do in short-term memory. And this has become really apparent in the World Memory Championships. So one of the tests that is uh, probably the highlight of the World Memory Championships is the memorization of spoken digits. So the idea is you stand on a stage at the World Memory Championships and somebody calls out numbers to you, one every second, and then you have to repeat them back. And for many years, the world record was 11. Most people can do six or seven. Some people can do more. The world record from about 1900 onwards was 11. Somebody could actually hold 11 digits in their head and repeat them back in order 
Yeah. But things have got a lot better. The current record is over 450. And most people just find that astonishing. And how can you listen to digits being spoken at the rate of one a second for seven minutes and repeat them back flawlessly? The current world championship, Lance Scherhardt from Texas, actually does it by having a, a mnemonic. What he does is he's associated every three digits string from 000 to 999 with an object. And so when he, see, when he hears one set of digits, he might think one thing and another set of digits, he thinks another thing, and he combines them in groups of three. So one set of digits might be a power outlet, one might be a dart, and one might be a, an explosion. And therefore he thinks of a dart hitting a power outlet and making an explosion, and that's nine digits. The important point is what he can do with his short-term memory is constantly and always influenced by what's in his so what he can do with his short-term memory is influenced by what it is in his long-term memory. This is probably most clearly illustrated by the work on chess. So the earliest studies here were done in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and then that was picked up by Adrian de Groot in the Netherlands, and these were replicated by Neil and Simon. So people were shown a chessboard with a set of um, chess pieces on there, and they were asked then when the board was taken away to reproduce what they'd seen. And what they found was that if you for, the, for experts, they did better than novices. There were two scenarios they used, a middle game, so sort of 30 to 40 moves in with 25 pieces on the board. And towards the end of the game, something like 80 moves into the game, there were far fewer pieces on the board. So here's what's interesting. The expert players got 16 pieces right. The club, players got nine, the club player got nine and the novice got five right. But what's interesting is that when the pieces were randomly placed, the expert was hardly any better than the club player and the novice was almost as good. But when it was an end game situation, there was much less difference between the club player and the expert. Why? Because the position was less familiar. And so some experts later re realized that what was happening here was that they weren't actually memorizing the board, they were recognizing it. And Simon and Gil Martin reckoned that every chess grandmaster has something like 13 and a half thousand chunks of memory. And this is what drives this really important model of, 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 of memory. Uh, basically, the environment triggers our awareness of things and brings them into short-term memory and that's also influenced by what's in long-term memory. The really, really important point is that short-term memory is limited and long-term memory is effectively limitless. So always what we can do in our short-term memory is influenced by what it is in our long-term memory. And this is nicely illustrated by this, this story about football. So here you have some students being um, given a, a passage about a story about young players experience of a football game and they were tested sometime later, 15 minutes later, with a kind of closed procedure with some blanks they had to fill in. And here's how they did. So what's interesting is, obviously, the ones with low football knowledge and low reading ability did worst of all. That's pretty, that's pretty uh, obvious. What is interesting is reading ability had very little impact on their score. So those who are high in reading ability, but low on football knowledge, did hardly any better than those who had low reading ability. Those who had high football knowledge did much better, almost irrespective of their reading ability. And this has been replicated many times in things like baseball in the United States. And what we find is it's the knowledge of the thing being written about or talked about that determines how good you are at making sense of what you're hearing or reading. And that's why long-term memory is always influencing short-term memory. And now, this has sort of resulted in some quite um, controversial quotes, I would say. So Kirshner, Swell and Clark say that learning is a change in long-term memory. And a lot of people dislike that idea because they think that's just memorization, and it's not. The point is that those psychologists using the term memory to describe all the things that you can learn how to do. So for example, where is the ability to, store, to ride a bike store? It's in your memory. 
people often talk about muscle memory, but there's actually no such thing. If you sign your name normally and do it 10 times the size on a blackboard, it'll look the same, even though completely different muscles are involved. The memory isn't in the muscles, the memory is in the mind. And so learning is a change in long-term memory. Everything that you don't have to relearn how to do is in your long-term memory. How to ride a bicycle, what your children look like, your attitudes, your dispositions, your beliefs, how caring you are, all those things are in long-term memory. The important point in this definition from Kirchner, Swallow and Clark is it's about a change in long-term memory. And I think this is really important because very often our standard operational procedure in teaching is to teach students something, and if they can do it by the end of the lesson and they can still do it tomorrow, we are happy. But what every teacher has discovered is that the fact that students have successfully completed an activity today is no guarantee that they'll actually be able to remember it in two weeks' time. And I think this definition is important because it's what it's saying is, if you can do it today, but you've forgotten it in two weeks' time, then you haven't really learned it. So this is actually, this definition is actually a way of reserving the word learning for the long-term changes in what we can do. And to say that anything else we have to give a different light label to is it's not really learning. And that's why they say the aim of all instruction, all teaching, is to alter long-term memory. If nothing has changed in long-term memory, nothing has been learned. And I think the other important point is, as um, John Sweller has pointed out, that's what makes experts. It's the contents of their long-term memory. He says that novices need to use thinking skills, experts use knowledge. And that's why curricula matters. You know, one of the most pernicious myths around right now is that knowledge isn't important. You can always Google it, people say. Well, that's true up to a point, but you don't know what to Google, and you'll always be slower if you're having to go and look things up rather than actually having them jump into your consciousness as the numbers did in that countdown time. Um, we, people have been focusing recently on authentic tasks, and of course, authentic tasks are engaging for students. Students are actually getting more stuck in, they, they're enjoying school more, but often they're learning less. And then the final one, this is echoes the work of E.D. Hirsch, we should be teaching skills, not content. The important point is there's no real difference. Um, when people talk about skills, I ask them, well, what do you mean by skills? And what they exhibit are almost always highly specific. Now, I don't want to go too far here. There's a famous joke about somebody causing an accident by driving around a roundabout the wrong way. And the police officer asks the driver, have you ever been around a roundabout before? And the driver says, of course I have, but not this one. That's a joke because that's silly. The idea is that of course something is generalized. So the idea that you have never driven around this roundabout before means you don't know what to do with it is, is, is crazy. The fact is some things do generalize. And we've actually seen some quite strong generalizations in things like, believe it or not, in chicken sexing. So it turns out that chicken sexing is quite hard to do and quite an important skill because day old chicks are gassed if they're male and they're kept for egg laying if they're female. And for years it was thought that this would take about six to 10 years to learn as a skill. And it turned out that teaching people about logical classification speeded this process up. So there's clearly some things that are generalizable. You can learn them in one context and immediately apply them in other contexts. But the evidence is that most of the things that we want our students to be able to do are highly context specific. And so even within a domain like history, there are some general things about the importance of cause and effect, of chronology, of reconciling conflicting documentary sources. But what I've been struck by when I talk to professional historians is how quickly they say, not my period. In other words, for all their skills as historians, they don't have the knowledge to make sense of the events. And so what I think we need to be accepting is that what makes people powerful in reasoning is the contents of their long-term memory. Um, another related point is that you know, we get students doing more authentic tasks or more real tasks. And again, the evidence is that makes the achievement gap between poor kids and rich kids even bigger because those poor kids are no longer getting in school where they used to be while the rich kids are still getting that from home. That's why I suggest that the main purpose of curriculum is to increase the contents of long-term memory. 
There's lots of ways we could go about doing that, but I think as long as we think of, we need to be accumulating our, our children's knowledge, we need to be building it up, and I think this is probably less of an issue in the UK than it is in the US. But if we teach children something, we should be able to expect them to want to know it for forever. You know, if I'm teaching you this today, it's always going to be important. And the idea that I, I can forget that because I learned it last year, I think you have to get rid of and say to all children, if I've ever taught it to you, it's important. And that's why we need knowledge to accumulate because that's what makes people effective thinkers. The second thing that the research suggests has a big impact on children's achievements is investing in the teachers we already have. And I want to just go back a step to the work of uh, Anders Ericsson and others on expertise. And now, I should say at the beginning, I think that in many cases, Anders Ericsson takes up an extreme position where he says that basically talent doesn't matter. The work of people like David Hambrick have suggested you know, in chess, talent does matter. And so there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that some people find learning quicker, they, they become experts move more quickly. But I think what he's suggested, I think quite um, convincingly, is this thing he calls deliberate practice. In other words, we get better at things by focusing really hard on getting better at the things we can't yet do. And it's that commitment to deliberate practice that distinguishes novices from experts. What is interesting, of course, is that it's effortful, it's hard, and people don't like doing it. And you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not intrinsically motivating. You, know, you don't get better by, on the violin by just playing the things you want to play, or like to play. It's through the things you can't yet play, and it's often very frustrating. Now, some people have applied this to teaching, and I think that's premature because right now, we are not able to do deliberate practice in teaching because one of the key requirements of deliberate practice is feedback. Feedback that is guaranteed to be accurate. Feedback that if given and acted upon will improve performance. And right now, we don't know enough about what the more effective teachers do for that kind of feedback to be guaranteed to be effective. So we can do purposeful practice. It's another technical term that Anders Ericsson uses where we are trying to get better at the things we can't yet do. But I don't think we are yet in a position to call it deliberate practice because we don't yet know what makes good teachers good. And therefore, we can't give feedback that guarantees improvement. I think that's a really important point that we have to bear in mind. But here's the important thing, takeaway for me. I've looked at expertise in teaching. and I've looked at expertise in other domains like table tennis and x-ray radiography and scuba diving and acting and chess. And it's interesting that expertise in teaching has many of the same hallmarks. And for the expertise elsewhere not to apply to teaching, teaching would have to be different from all those and the oils would have to be similar. So I conclude that basically what's true for, for, for other subjects is true for teaching. And that means that 10 years of deliberate practice or as close as we can get to it in teaching would probably make most teachers pretty good. I often ask head teachers, you know, with the right support, how many of the teachers in your school could be as good as the very best? And the estimates vary. Some people are quite negative, only about 50%. Some people reckon that 90% of the teachers could be as good as the very best if they were committed to improving. So for me, the crucial thing is getting every single teacher improving, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. And to do that, we have to be focused. So the really important point here is we have to be focused on improvement, not evaluation. The reason is very simple. Evaluation frameworks, all the frameworks we use for evaluating teachers, like the, the, the new standards for beginning teachers, they have to be comprehensive. They have to include everything that teachers do. Some things are important and some things not. So when you give teachers a general framework, you at best incentivize the improvement on all aspects of practice, and at worst, incentivize improvement on the aspects of practice that are easiest to improve. On the other hand, improvement frameworks are selective. They focus on the aspects of practice with the biggest payoff for students. So in other words, we're focusing on not just anything that might help, but the things that will have the biggest impact on how much our children learn over the longer term. And that's why any leader who actually gives teachers a whole framework and says, just get better at, the, at, at this, is actually missing a trick. Because we have, to, we have to focus 
on the things with the biggest payoff for students. So what should teachers get better at? Well, I mean, obviously, since Tom is listening, I'm sure that behavior management will be, top, will be pretty high up the list. Um, but right now, we don't know how much more learning happens if teachers get better at behavior management. Subject knowledge is always a lament. That we have, you know, we say that people, um, particularly primary school teachers, don't have enough math subject knowledge. And what's interesting there is that even if you look at pedagogical content knowledge, the knowledge of the subject at the level of teaching it, the relationship between that and student achievement is quite weak. So making an average teacher into one of the best one in six teachers in terms of pedagogical content knowledge in primary school would give a child something like an extra two to three weeks progress in maths every year. But the teachers who are overall best are getting something like six months more progress. So the evidence suggests that even at primary school, pedagogical content knowledge is only about 10% of teacher quality. Obviously, things would be better if teachers were better at instruction design. But again, we don't yet have firm estimates of how much more improvement we get if we actually improve that. What we do have evidence about is pedagogical skill. And so what I'm going to suggest is that along with a knowledge-rich curriculum, Getting teachers to focus on a formative assessment is probably the most powerful thing we can do to improve student learning. So I want to give you five perspectives on formative assessment. The first I call, and they call the empirical, the intuitive, the cross-cultural, the functional, and the equity perspective. So the empirical perspective, well, that's the research that Paul Black and I reviewed. There's 18 reviews of research there. And when you look at feedback and other related aspects of formative assessment, you find that just about everywhere this has been looked at, on average, things get better. Now, of course, there are some fairly important findings, like Klugund and Nisi found that over a third of feedback studies found that feedback made things worse. But I think we're fairly clear now about why that is. And therefore, there's a substantial amount of evidence that whenever people have looked at this, attention to feedback and related processes makes things better. The intuitive perspective of formative assessment is perhaps even simpler. It goes back to a principle about learning and an uncomfortable fact about the world. As David Algebal said over 50 years ago now, if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, I would say this. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach accordingly. In other words, start from where the learner is. Why is it so hard? Because students do not learn what we teach. Now, there's an important critique here. Um, learning is a change in long-term memory, as I said earlier. So the fact that students can do something at the end of this lesson does not mean they can do it in two weeks' time. But if they can't do it at the end of today's lesson, it's highly unlikely they'll be able to do it in two weeks' time. In other words, teachers will make better decisions if they have better evidence about what's going on in their children's heads. The cross-cultural perspective comes from uh, the 2015 round of PISA, where they looked at science achievements in particular, and they looked at the, the factors that were associated with high student achievement in science. And of course, this is a cross-sectional study, so you can't infer uh, causation. But um, what they found is that after the student's socioeconomic profile, the single most important factor in high science achievement was the extent to which teachers changed what they did as a result of evidence from students about what was going on in their heads. Now, of course, it could be that in classrooms full of highly motivated children, this is easier to do, so you can't be clear what's causing what. But I think the fact that across 75 countries, the extent to which teachers were adapting their teaching on the light, in light of evidence from their students is suggestive that this is actually quite a, a widespread and important variable. The functional perspective, um, in America, formative assessment is often used to discuss, to, to describe testing as it was AFL in England. And what I suggest is we need to look more carefully at the cycles involved. And so what I'm suggesting is that the long cycle formative assessment, like what we used to call assessment for learning, monitoring student progress, is a good thing to do. It's a good idea to share students, uh, share success criteria with students so they know whether they're making progress. And we also need to do the short cycle stuff minute by minute and day by day, because then you increase the engagement of the students and you make teaching more responsive to students' needs. 
And the point is we have to do all of these things. Any well-run organization should be monitoring progress towards its goals, but that's not enough. We also have to be sharing this with the students and making adjustments in real time. The second aspect of the functional perspective is to think about what's involved in formative assessment and this grid, I think, um, explains why I think that the five main things in effective formative assessment are clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions, getting evidence about where students are in their learning, feeding back appropriately, and then students as resources for one another and students as owners of their own learning. And these five strategies seem to me to exhaust the terrain of formative assessment. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that a while back on Twitter, I said that calling this stuff formative assessment was a mistake, and I should have called it responsive teaching. The point is, these five strategies are not responsive teaching. Responsive teaching is just that first one. It's it, it, those, those two strategies there. The reason we called it formative assessment rather than responsive teaching is because we wanted to bring in the fact that you have to change what students do in classrooms as well as what teachers do. But, unfortunately, the term formative assessment was misunderstood and therefore I'm often quoting the assessment for learning, which is not at all the same thing in my view. Um, so the problem is that I think we would be better had I called it for responsive teaching because then we could have added in the learner's role. And right now, the term formative assessment has become um, associated with things that I think are unhelpful. But I just thought that picture might be helpful. And of course, it also clarifies that before you can even begin, the teacher needs to be clear about where the learner go. It's not necessary to share learning intentions with students. That's a professional judgment of the teacher. But the teacher can't even begin before they're clear about what it is they want their children to do. The equity perspective comes from the work of the Education Endowment Foundation and their teaching and learning toolkit, where they looked at lots of different things we might do to close the achievement gap. And I've included all the slides here, but I want to focus on the top three things. Feedback, metacognition, self-regulation, and peer tutoring, which they reckon are the three most cost-effective things to close the achievement gap. Why does that matter? Well, the first one was feedback. The second was metacognition and self-regulated learning. The third one was peer tutoring. So in other words, three of the five strategies for formative assessment are the three most cost-effective ways of closing the achievement gap. What about the other two? Well, you can't give feedback until you find out what's going wrong. And you don't know what questions to ask until you're clear about the learning intentions. So I think these five strategies form a minimum set of the biggest impact ways of improving student achievement. The problem is the classroom formative assessment involves changing teacher habits, changing what teachers do minute by minute in the classroom. And what I've discovered in 30 years of doing professional development it's generally much easier to change what teachers do when students are not present than it is to change what teachers do when students are present. So over the last 30 or so years, we've had lots of critical friendship groups and coaching triads and instructional data teams where teachers meet together after school, look at data, talk about stuff, and go back to their classrooms and teach them exactly the same way as they did before. What I'm suggesting is that we need to think much more clearly about how to help teachers change their classroom habits. And that's an important point. It's habit change, not knowledge acquisition. Just about every teacher I know knows the research on wait time. They know they don't wait long enough at the end of a question to give children a chance to think. But telling them about that doesn't actually change their behaviors. So what we think we need to actually get this happening is a commitment by every single teacher to continually improving practice and an agreement to focus on those things that make a difference to students. So no more brain gym, no more learning styles. It's frankly self-indulgent to get better at things that don't help children when there's evidence about what does. And what leaders need to do is to create the environment within which that can take place by first of all, creating those expectations. I think it should be the most natural thing in the world for a head teacher to ask a teacher, what are you working on getting better at right now? And how can I help? And then keeping the focus on the things that make a difference to students. So stopping that drift towards, towards the, the next big thing. We're always looking for the next big thing in education. We haven't done the last big thing properly. Giving teachers time to think. Teachers in England are some of the busiest in the world. And just getting teachers an hour every couple of weeks to think about practice seems to be very difficult. But when it happens, it's, it's generally very productive. 
and of course supporting risk taking. And every principal I've ever met says they believe in risk taking, but they don't want things to go wrong. So my advice to principals is never praise people for risks that pay off. Praise people for risks at the moment the risk is taken when nobody knows how it's going to pay off. There's two benefits. First of all, you stop people taking stupid risks. But the important point then is you're creating a risk-taking culture. You're not saying play safe, you're saying take genuine risks. And that's as, as resulted in this model of teacher learning that we call content then process. So the content, what I want teachers to change, I'm saying it's formative assessment, and the strategies I mentioned are the way to get started. The process that we think is most powerful for doing this is to give teachers choice about what to work on. That every teacher should choose which aspect of formative assessment they want to prioritize. Allowing teachers to adapt these things. One of the things I've learned in 30 years of doing work in schools is no educational innovation can be implemented in a real classroom in the way invent, intended by its inventor. Things always have to be adjusted and if teachers don't have the understanding of the innovation, then they can't make smart decisions about how to adjust this to make it work in a particular classroom. So teachers have to be given the flexibility they need to be allowed to take small steps to change habits. They need to be held accountable and they need to be given support. And the way we found that most easy to do at scale is through these things that we call uh, teacher learning communities. So we produce a, a program called Embedding Formative Assessment focused on those strategies of formative assessment, supported by teachers meeting in self-led groups uh, every month, 75 minutes, and doing peer observation. And a recent evaluation of that uh, by, um, by the Education Endowment Foundation showed a really large impact on student achievement. So um, to summarize, there are lots of things we can change about education. Some will actually impact on student achievement, but any reform means that you you can't do something else at that same time. When we ask those four questions that I mentioned earlier, does this solve the problem we have? How much will this cost? How much extra achievement will we get if we do this? And can we do this here? Two things seem to come out way up above the other things we know about right now. The first is a knowledge-rich curriculum, and the second is improved teacher pedagogical skill. Any school that focuses on those two things is right now, as far as we're aware, likely to have a bigger impact on student achievement than all the other things we could be doing. The important point I want to make is that all those other things we could be doing, most of them are supported by research. Most of them make things better, but they don't make things better as much. And because our children and our pupils need our best work now, I think we have to have schools focusing on the things with the biggest payoff for students. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there because I know we've, had, we've picked up um, uh, quite a few questions. So, um, Tom, um, any questions there you think are particularly uh, yeah, relevant? Yeah, sure. To um, one of the, uh, there, there was uh, quite a few questions which came through, especially particularly earlier on. I'm going to start with one from Toby Little here. He said, what would Dylan's recommendation for designing a CPD curriculum for teachers look like? I mean, you've touched upon that already, but I wonder if you can expand upon that. Well, I think the, the big idea here is that the job of the, of the principal or the head teacher is to focus teachers' efforts onto the things with, with big, um, big impacts, but then to leave it alone. So I, I, I call this sort of top-down and bottom-up. So the top-down bit is, you know, if you're, a, if I'm the head teacher, if you're a teacher in my school, you will be getting better at something. That's non-negotiable. And the second non-negotiable, it's gonna be something that has a pretty large impact on student achievement in terms of our current research evidence. Beyond that, it's up to you. So that's why I think choice is so important. So you have to constrain the choice so that people don't do brain gym or learning styles. But then you just create that culture where every single teacher ag agrees they need to get better and then teachers support each other in getting better. And so one of the things that we find it quite important to resist is that we'll put the teachers who want to work on questioning in one group and the teachers who want to work on feedback in a different group. We find it much more productive when teachers in primary schools from different age classes, in secondary schools, teachers from different subjects, when they meet together, 
because then you get that cross fertilization and teachers find ways of, you, know, you, you can't apply a technique from science straight into a history classroom mm. but by thinking about what kind of problem that's addressing you might be able to adapt it for a different context and so that kind of a mixed subject or mixed age group in primary schools i think is is the way forward and again within this culture where every single teacher agrees they need to get better even if they think they're already the best teacher in the school get rid of that com that, co that conversation around you know who's the best teacher and just say don't care how good you are everybody's getting better sure thank you um another question from the mononymic helen uh, how would you balance? I mean, there's a there's a kind of slip, slip, I guess there's a there's a, a political question also being addressed here. But how would you balance a knowledge rich curriculum with an exam system which is determined on maximising the number of assessments? Uh, the, the, there's a kind of follow up here which says realistically we need to build time for assimilation of knowledge rather than the relentless acquisition that the UK GCSE curriculum seems to insist upon. Is there anything in that you could comment on? Yeah, well, I think the, the important thing is, this, is the blue box on that um, slide where I talk about responsive teaching mm. before you can even begin. So you can't even begin to use formative assessment until you're clear about what it is you want students to learn. You can't even begin to design your curriculum until you want, it, what you want students to get better at. The, the important point is whatever it is you want students to get better at, it's basically knowledge. So different kinds of knowledge will lead to different kinds of teaching. Mm. The important point is what experts have in their heads that novices don't is rich, interconnected webs of knowledge. Let me give you an example. Um, a teacher asks a student, when was the Treaty of London signed? And one child says 1604, and the other child says, don't know, but it must have been early in the 17th century, because by 1608 there was a permanent settlement in Jamestown, Virginia, um, and previous settlements had failed because they relied on supplies from England, which had been disrupted by the Spanish Armada. Um, and therefore, although the Armada was defeated in 1588, the, the war wasn't settled until the Treaty of London was, um, was signed. Now, the, the important point is the first kid has the knowledge of the correct answer. The second kid has no idea what the correct answer is, but they know how it fits into a web of other things. And all that is knowledge. So what that check, second child has is knowledge of how these facts interrelate. And so that's the kind of thing I'm arguing for. And it's all in long-term memory. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another one from uh, Cuckoo90. I don't think that's, that's a real name, if I'm honest. Um, what Cuckoo90 is suggesting is this. Teacher A, there's two teachers here, teacher A and teacher B. Teacher A has got weak subject knowledge, but strong pedagogical skill. And teacher B has got strong subject knowledge, but very weak pedagogical skills. <laughs> Which one will have the best outcomes for children? Well, to answer that question, we need to give meanings to weak and strong. So let's just say weak is one standard deviation below the mean and strong is one standard deviation above the mean. So in elementary, primary level, there's no doubt that pedagogical skill is more important than content. knowledge. That relationship weakens as you get up into secondary school. And I'm pretty sure that by A level, that strong subject knowledge is probably far more important than pedagogical skill, partly because you really can't teach stuff you know nothing about, but also possibly because by the time you get to A level, children may be differentially motivated. You've probably only got the people who are really motivated. So I think you can't separate those things out. But, but in terms of what, what you could do, once that a deviation, there's no doubt that for most of schooling, pedagogical skill is more important. But here's the other point. It doesn't matter how important something is if you can't change it. As the basketball coach said when he was asked, what do you look for in, in drafting players? He said, you can't teach height. You can do anything. <laughs> if I can change it, I'll change it. But no, I can't teach height. So the important thing is not which is good and which is bad, weak versus strong. It's if we had 25 hours of professional development time, what use of those 25 hours would have the biggest impact on student achievement? And what I'm pretty certain about is 25%, 25 hours developing content knowledge is going to have a smaller impact than 25 hours on pedagogical skill. I think that's the important policy issue mm -hmm. because pedagogical skill can be used everywhere. It is one of those very few transferable skills. Content knowledge improvement only improves your teaching of the things that you're, that you're studying. 
So it's the generalizability of pedagogical skill, I think, that makes it a, a, a more appropriate focus for professional development. Okay, thank you. Here's a slightly more foundational question, um, and several people have asked it, so perhaps this is a, a classic moment of AFL for us here. Um, many people, including Saida, have asked, how are you defining a good teacher if you say that there's no way to evaluate a teacher? Can you tease that? Yeah, this is a very important point. So what I'm saying is we're not able to evaluate the effectiveness of any single teacher because the error of measurement is so big. So to take the example of Tim Clifford, if you take New York's system, where every teacher is given a value added rating from zero to 100, the error of measurement is probably around 50 points. So my guess is that Tim Clifford is an average teacher. And the first year, he was unlucky, and he got a score way towards the bottom end of the, rate, uh, the, um, the margin of error. And the second year, he got a very good score um, towards the top end of the margin of error. So it's 50 points either way. But here's the important point. If you have 100 teachers, then the average quality of those 100 teachers can be judged much more accurately because for every teacher who gets a rating that's too high, there'll be another teacher who gets a rating that's too low. So although you can't identify the quality of an individual teacher, you can because the averaging outs that I just mentioned determine that some teachers are more effective than others. It's, it's, it's quite a geeky statistical point, but it's crucial and it's, it's a very good question to ask. Yeah, and I, I think it's probably a very pertinent point considering that many of the decisions we make in schools are very much based on a teacher-to-teacher -teacher basis rather than across cohorts. Um, a question here from, uh, blah, 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 from Tom, but not me, but great name. Uh, how do you engender a commitment to CPD in teaching staff? Do you think a lack of commitment or time is the biggest roadblock to achieving these five AFL strategies? The number of schools I've worked in convinces me that there's no single um, problem here. I'm reminded of Tolstoy's idea that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So every, every school that's struggling is probably struggling in its own way. Um, but I said, I think the first thing is just normalizing improvement. Um, there's, a, there's a middle school in Boulder, Colorado, um, it's called Casey Middle School. And it's just amazing. Every teacher has chosen to post on their door the things that they are trying to get better at. Um, and it's just called Observe Me. And so a visitor to the school is invited, if they have spare time, to come and give feedback. Give me feedback on the things that I'm trying to get better at. Mm. And so um, Justin McMillan, the, the principal, has just created this, uh, this environment by constantly stressing this, that how important it is for everybody to be getting better. And so the, shifting the focus away, I don't care how good you are, I just care that you're getting better. And it, it, that, that message, and the thing I said earlier, uh, should be the most natural thing in the world for a principal to be asking a teacher, what are you working on getting better at right now? And how can I help? So just normalizing that, that improvement rather than actually trying to work out who the good teachers are and who the bad teachers are. Okay, thank you. One from uh, Olivia Mitson. This, this is uh, digging into a, a, a piece of detail you, you alluded to. You mentioned feedback making progress worse. Could you elaborate on when or in what circumstances this could happen? Well, that finding comes from this review by Kluger and Denisi, which may be the most unreadable um, research report ever. It's a definitely a both elbows on the table read. That's a high bar. And basically, it's much more quoted than, than read. Um, but and hardly, everybody, hardly anybody reads the last page. What they point out there is that often feedback is unsuccessful for the longer term because feedback makes students more dependent on the feedback. Mm. So it improves performance in the short term by making students more dependent. But when, when the feedback is no longer present, the students are not able to reproduce the same level of performance. So it, it can make the students dependent. Obviously, it can, it can demotivate students if it's too negative. Basically, students can either change their behavior, change the goal, abandon the goal, or reject the feedback. And so, basically, when the students are falling short of the goal, we want them to try harder. If they reach the goal, we want them to just change the goal to a different goal. And so that's why there's an awful lot of things that could go wrong with feedback. And it's not one single thing. It's students rejecting the feedback, thinking the work is too easy or too hard, students settling for an easy life. All those kinds of things can make feedback ineffective in the longer term, even though it can be effective in the shorter term. Okay, thank you. John Park says, Dylan mentions that feedback is important for deliberate practice. Would it be correct in saying that time is also important? 
Whilst a broad curriculum is important, if there is too much to learn, will the opportunities for deliberate practice be reduced? So well, I think deliberate practice is specific to the research on expertise. But in terms of the broader issue there, there is no doubt that there's far too much stuff in our curriculum. Uh, I, I wondered about why this is, and I, my conclusion is that curriculum developers cannot bear the thought that any children might have spare time on their hands. So they actually make sure there's enough stuff in the curriculum for the fastest learning students to be occupied all year. And so there's far too much for most students. And so teachers have to make a choice. And some teachers just teach the curriculum, they meter it out and they actually go from the beginning to the end. And you know, 20% of the kids get it and the rest is falling behind. I think that's logically consistent, but immoral. What I'm saying is if the curriculum is too full, you have to make a professional decision about what stuff you're gonna leave out. And the important point here is that not all content is equally important. I used to teach science. I used to love teaching phases of the moon. But you know what? If kids don't get it, nothing bad happens. There's nothing they're going to learn in the next five years that really depends on getting phases of the moon. But the particular nature of matter is very important. And if kids don't get it, that's going to be really serious. In maths, place value is really important. Roman numerals, not quite so important. So teachers have to make choices about which bits to prioritize, and which bits to deprioritize. And if you feel you have to cover everything, then my concrete suggestion is delegate the less important stuff to homework. That way you can claim that this was taught, <laughs> didn't do the homework, but at least you could actually say hand on heart, we covered the entire curriculum. But I, as I said, for me, formative assessment requires creating a slack. Mm. There's no point in doing formative assessment if you have no slack, because you're wasting time assessing that you could be teaching. And in fact, a German study found exactly that. The least effective teachers were the ones who did formative assessment, but didn't have any time to use the information. They were less effective than the teachers who did no formative assessment, because those teachers weren't wasting time on using information, on collecting information they couldn't use. The most effective teachers were the ones who collected the evidence, but also had a range of pedagogical strategies for using that information to adjust their teaching. Thank you. I can see this going through the, the, tw the Twitter meet mincer and coming out as Dylan Williams says, don't learn the phases of the moon. Um, we've just got time for a couple of, perhaps one more question then. How can you, uh, how can risk taking work in an accountability driven system? Perhaps it's time for a quick answer there. Well, I, I, you know, I often ask head teachers, are your teachers worried about Ofsted? Are your teachers worried about exam results? And they often say yes. And I said, well, in that case, you need to change the way you're doing your job. Because I think that if teachers are worried, if they're second guessing all the time what Ofsted will say, what the exam results will be, they're going to worry about that rather than doing the things the schools agreed to be part of. Mm. So I think that heads and principals need to take that pressure and say, look, as a school, we've agreed this is what we're going to do. And you will never get into trouble, but not for doing what we've agreed you should be doing. So I think it's the head's job to absorb that. My, my, my wife, uh, Siobhan, uh, she used to describe herself when she was a, a high school principal as a deflective practitioner. She saw her job as stopping all the crap that reigns in on the school <laughs> and getting in the way of schools doing what they should be doing. And she would say to the local authority, we're not doing it. And they said, you've got to do it. She said, we're still not doing it. Because she wanted to create that learning culture in the school. And her job was to insulate the teachers from the opprobrium that they would get if you know people if parents didn't like what was going on and she said just send the, just send the parents to me yeah you know, creating that culture where teachers can do that learning take, takes a lot of nerve i think from principals but it's got to be done otherwise teachers will be second guessing every single idea that comes up, comes along and you probably won't get very much change fabulous dylan i could listen all day it's a characteristically very steep learning curve whenever i listen to you and it's always a pleasure to do so. You have been characteristically generous with your time and your expertise. I hope you're safe and well. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have been watching this. I'm sure we'll be watching over the next few days. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope to see you very soon in happier times. Thank you very much. Thank you.